Wireless LAN Weekly, Episode 51. Welcome to the Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast. Bringing together the valuable knowledge of WLAN industry experts, news, and the latest technology developments, tools, and best practices. A place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Here is your host, WLAN veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. Welcome. This is Keith Parsons. I'm the host of the Wireless Land Weekly Podcast, and we're glad you joined us again for episode 51. Today's main topic isn't going to be about technology or wireless or anything like that. We have an opportunity to talk with Devin Aiken about some soft skills. He's been studying and learning how to evaluate personality types, and so he's going to talk to us a little bit about the topic of It's All About the People. In our tutorial, we'll be talking about the radio tap header and how wireless NICs add that extra piece of information and prepend it to their frames as they send up the stack. And we find out who is Blake Crony. A word for the WLAN Geek Dictionary. Pre-shared key. Pre-shared key is a TKIP passphrase. It is not the encryption key. It is a passphrase used to protect your network traffic in WPA. The Wi-Fi Alliance certifies this mode and calls it WPA Personal and is primarily recommended for home or small office use. WPA Enterprise uses individually generated keys from a radio server and is considered much more secure. Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast. Your source of education, information, entertainment, and inspiration. Welcome to our uh, main topic today. This is a soft skills topic. We're going to talk about it's all about the people. I'm here today with uh, Devin Aiken, uh, just as a... As a little background, for a while in my life, I had uh, Devin as a boss, and he had used this quote quite a bit, uh, actually for years now, about it's all about the people. And then after Tech Field Day and watching the delegates and the sponsors and the people who are talking there, I, I too uh, agreed with that and wrote a blog post about it's all about the people. So I thought we'd uh, get Devin on and do a little soft skills talk today instead of technology, talking about people. Welcome, Devin. Hey, thanks, Keith. I appreciate it. Hey, and loved your blog. I uh, I read it as soon as you posted it. So, uh I, uh, I'm a big fan of people. So, um, I really like it when, uh, when others focus on that topic as well. So, so thanks for taking the time to write such a blog. So if you remember, uh, back about four years ago, when I first got into this, uh, this in- industry, we had a, a, a podcast where I was on the phone. I remember being at, uh, at the headquarters office, um, and, and you were asking me about, uh, uh, you know, why did I move over to a vendor, the dark side and that kind of stuff. And and I started yakking on about, um, you know, it's all about the people. Did and I really call it the dark side? <laughs> I think everybody calls it the dark side. <laughs> I, I just get them all confused when you hear that 10,000 times. But, you know, to me, the people are the most valuable thing. They're the, the most important thing. And when I say people, I mean, you could, you could say, you know, everybody says, well, you know, my spouse, my kids, you know, my friends, my, my mom, you know, my dad, that, that kind of thing. Everybody would, would agree with me there. But uh, would you agree that, that uh, your coworkers and, um, and people who are not your friends and people who work at other vendors and, and your VARs and what about your customers, the people? Um, in general, the people are the most valuable thing in life. And, and so I think a lot of times at an employer, uh, especially a high speed, high stress employer like these Silicon Valley companies, and they certainly are, everybody's moving so quickly and everybody's working so hard and, and they're stressed a lot of times that people, they become or take a back seat, I would say, and people stop thinking of other people as valuable. They are either helping me or they're not. They're in my way or they're not. Um, you know, that they're useful to me or they're not. And they become objects to be um, taken advantage of, put down or whatever. And this is this is a shame to me. Uh, I really value people, friendships, and even other other views. You know, other people's opposing views because I can learn from them. So I just uh, I just adopted this saying. It's all about the people, and we started talking about it back back then, and and it keeps carrying forward. You know, some people have this have this appreciation for people, and some don't. Um, you know, to each his own, I guess. But it's important to me, and. I, I even have a, a personal creed, if you will, 
uh, that's very that I that I find very important, and that I like to be able to just kind of reel off. You know, when people you know go down this uh, this path, and that is there's uh, three things in a certain order that I think are most valuable. And, and, and the first one is integrity, integrity. And that you could, you could say also transparency and loving kindness and, and many things can go along with it, right? The truth, um, you know, put your cards on the table, that kind of thing. But if I rolled it all up together, I would say it's integrity. Um, and I think this is the most important thing of all because you can't build relationships with other people without it. Uh, whether they're your family or your coworkers or a stranger, you have to start with integrity. So uh, the second most important thing when you're talking about companies or you know organizations, the place you work, um, I think uh, is uh, is actually your employees. It's not your customers or your vars. It's your employees. Think about for a second. If uh, let's say a sales sales guy, an SE, uh, and me went out to a customer site, and we were talking to the customer, and we were bickering back and forth, or we were stabbing each other in the back verbally, or you know we were you know talking bad about people at HQ or whatever it was, then the customer looks at that and says, "Wow, you guys can't even get along, you know, and you're not supportive of each other." Then what makes you, you know, me think that you're going to support me when I have a support call, or I need a, to buy 50 more access points, or I, um, you know, I just want to understand how your cloud backend works. You know, if you can't even get along with your coworkers, you know, how are you going to get along with me? Uh, you don't even know me. So I think um, understanding and uh, having compassion for your coworkers and putting them first. And, and if you're a manager, taking care of those direct reports uh, that, that you have and making sure that their home life is okay and, and that they have what they need and they're rested if they, you know, they're weary, whatever it is, putting your employees first. I think that's really important. So first is integrity and second is employees. And I think the, the third part is, is kind of lumped together as your channel partners if you're a channel company and your customers. It's because in a, in a manner of speaking, uh, they're both your customers if you're a manufacturer. So they come third. So I'm a big fan of saying customers are third. And, and people go, third? No, customers here are first. Well, it, when customers are put first, their money in, invariably is put first. And when a customer's money is put first, then your employees and some with some people, even integrity then takes a back seat. So uh, then everything gets all backwards and people start mistreating each other and saying we have to make these numbers and we have to get this money and we have to get this deal. And they forget that first is our integrity. We don't lie, cheat, steal, mis, you know, mislead, trick or whatever. And secondly, the employees, you know, if, if you're going to win this deal, but your employees already pulled 100 hours this week and then you're asking him to pull 110 and, and he's got family issues he's got to deal with, this is not good. I'd rather lose the deal and keep my employee and make sure he's healthy and happy. So I think when you put customers first, you end up ruining your company, your organization, and eventually hurting the customer themselves. So, so again, the, the order of priority for me is integrity and then employees and then your, your channel slash customers. And if you keep that order, you will better serve your customers and you'll keep your employees and they'll be healthy and happy um, and you'll keep your integrity, which I think is important to everybody. That's really kind of lofty and deep. And so I'm going to give you a little counterpoint here just as a, as add a little bit of humor. Okay. I think my creed is an examined life isn't worth living. Okay. I've heard that. uh, I've heard that a lot. Yeah. I've heard that a lot. (laughs) Anyway, just to lighten up, lighten up the mood now. Okay. So that's, so that's your creed about dealing with people. How, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. So, uh, I believe that change starts with yourself. I, I think, you know, a lot of people hope to change others to suit themselves, but I think that's a little bit on the, uh, uh, pious side. I think that's how a lot of marriages break apart. Yeah, I think so. So I believe change starts with you. And, uh, uh, if, if you want to see, um, you know, others act with more integrity, you should act with more integrity. Maybe they'll follow. Maybe they'll like your example. Uh, if, if you want people to be more direct, then you be more direct. Or if you want people to calm down, you calm down. Um, you know, whatever it is, it starts with you. So I, I, uh, a while back, I was introduced uh, by my former CEO, and I, I'll always appreciate this, um, introduced to something called the Enneagram. And it's a study of personality types. And it is, um, it's much more than that. That's putting the Enneagram in a box, I would say. But I'll say if I, you know, without hours and hours to go th- through its aspects, I will say that in a nutshell, 
it helps us understand um, our own person personality types or set of um, actions, reactions, thoughts, feelings, and things like this, as well as that of others. So is this kind of like uh, Myers Briggs kind of testing, or it is colors, or those kind of that that kind of personality testing from the perspective of understanding personality behavior and reaction and motivation uh, and things like this you could you could put it in in a box like that but I think it's much much more than this and that's what we we don't have time for today so you know I would say I'll try to keep it as brief as I can but in a nutshell in understanding that there are um, you know various personality types in the the Enneagram system there are nine uh, personality types. And there's a lot of uh, variations, of course. You have concepts of um, uh, types and wings and uh, instincts and tri-types. There's, there's so many concepts there that, you know, it, take, it can take, you know, a, a really intelligent person, you know, weeks or somebody like me, months um, to absorb the, the, uh, the bigger picture of it all. But it is, it's helpful to me or it has been helpful to me it helps me to understand myself and how I treat myself and how I per, I'm perceived by other people and 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 by other different people. So, you know, I may be perceived I'm a type eight, so I might be perceived by another type eight in one way or perceived by type one uh, in another way. So I have to be able to first have compassion for myself and and, you know, I'm pretty hard on myself. There's other types that are even harder on themselves. Um, but I, I have some compassion for myself and understanding of myself and, and how I affect others. And then of course, how others think and how it's either the same or different than me and how they affect me and understand that, you know, to be, I need to be more present, not to be on autopilot. I need to understand how I'm reacting or thinking about a certain thing that happened or will happen. Um, and what my shortcomings are or my tendencies are. And, and so how does this how does this help in a practical everyday life? You know, having an understanding of these these nine types and all these different uh, nuances of the nine types. Well, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. You know, I have twins, um, Abby and Hannah, and they're 14 now. And uh, anybody who, who has teenage girls will understand the challenge of having teenage girls um, or any kids in general. And, and they have very, very different personalities. Uh, Abby is a, a type eight like me. Uh, her, her, you know, her, her instinct and her tri-types are different. So she should not act exactly like me or think exactly like me, but it's very similar. And so I, my wife tells me all the time, uh, you, you just seem to get her. You seem to understand her better. And she just makes me crazy sometimes. And, and, um, uh, and of course my wife's a type two, so I can, I can get that she doesn't see the world the same as me or Abby. And then my other daughter, Hannah, is a type nine. You know, we uh, we call the, there's nicknames for all the different types and lots of nicknames for some of them. The nine is called the peacemaker generally. And it's a very calm and, um, you know, very easygoing. Uh, it likes its routines and uh, it likes to get along and it likes, uh, it doesn't like anger and, and heavy emotion and things like this. Whereas the eight is almost the opposite. It, it likes to push and challenge and and uh, poke and uh, uh, and it, it's very uh, protective and things like this. So you could almost call them near opposite. And so uh, I just didn't understand why, you know, Hannah was so easy to get along with and Abby was so, you know, hard to get along with until I understood myself and then how she was similar. So it's it's brought harmony and it's brought uh, peacefulness into our home uh, to understand that everybody's a little different and how are they different and how do they like things and how are they what are they afraid of and what motivates them and what do they want? What's their main desire? So how would someone learn? I mean, you're you're throwing out types and numbers and and, and words, because you're you're into it. How would someone learn this yep. the different types so they could understand the 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 context of what you're talking about? So I'll tell you how I started. Um, you know, I was introduced to the Enneagram through uh, a, a little seminar uh, given here locally in Silicon Valley um, uh, by a lady named uh, Susan Olasek, and and she has her own website. She's a, a local teacher that's just very very good and. And, uh, and so she came to our company and held a kind of a, a two day seminar for our executive staff. And, and I found it just truly enlightening, um, to see how everybody was so different and it was very helpful. And so from there, I started reading the books she gave us. And then, uh, suddenly I, I realized there was more books. So I read those books. It's kind of like, uh, you know, Forrest Gump, right? Well, I ran to the state line, I just keep on going. It's kind of like that. So 
uh, I just kept on going. Well, then I attended a full week-long course with the Enneagram Institute. And then uh, here coming up in October, I have um, uh, two more classes with the Enneagram Institute uh, where I actually fly to them and sit through their class. And um, so I find it fascinating enough to, you know, spend my own time, my own money, you know, uh, on materials. And 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 I've downloaded, you know, countless, uh, you know, webcasts and and things like this from various websites. There's several really good ones out there and, you know, different sources out there that are fantastic. So that's how I started learning this. So you went, you know, obviously decades of your life without it. Yeah. What's the benefit to someone else if they're one of our listeners right. who, who says, okay, I don't even know what type I am. How's it going to, why, why should I care about this, these little numbers that Devin is talking about? So I will give you some specific examples. I think stories tell, you know, or resonate louder than just saying, hey, do this, don't do this, or it's cool. I think stories are important. Uh, being an evangelist, that's helpful. So I was in a meeting once, a sales meeting, and I was with a manager, a regional sales manager, and she was a type eight. Uh, so she and I, you know, thought very similarly about things, not exactly, but similarly. And then the first person to walk in the room at this sales meeting was the va- was one of the, it was actually with a VAR, was a type five. Now, uh, after doing this for quite a long time, I've come to recognize some key indicators of people's types. I'm not always right, but I'm, you know, I'm you know, write a lot. And, and so this person walks in and exhibited all the, the traits that you would expect from a type five. And, and, uh, and, I, and he's, you know, very quiet. He's observing, he's just listening. He's very polite. He's, you know, that, that guy. And, and we wanted to start the meeting and he said, Oh, I, I really like to wait for our manager. I'm like, okay. So, you know, he was, you know, just wanting to be thorough. And, and so we waited and the manager arrived. And immediately the manager dug right into me and he was like, hey, where are you from? How many kids you got? I mean, exhibited all the the typical behavior of a type two. And uh, so type two is, you know, this helper, this giver. They're very, you know, very heart centered. They're very my wife is a two. And 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 so here I have a type two that is very people oriented and a type five that's very uh, generally speaking, they're uh, they're very, you know, they're easy to get along with and things like this. But when, when you have a meeting like this, they're interested in what you're bringing. What's the technology? Show me what you got. I, I'm interested. I want to dig into it. And so when I started to do the presentation, what I realized was my, my audience uh, was opposites. I had one guy who was interested in me. I had one guy who's interested in the technology. And if I started talking relationally, then the one guy would tune in, the other t- tune out. And if I start talking only about bonjour gateways and and uh, you know airtime fairness, then the 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 other guy would tune out while the one tuned in. So I had to come up with a very quick strategy on what am I going to do here. So uh, my discussion went something like this: It was so you know this is the new bonjour gateway feature that we have, and here's the problem behind it. And already you could see the the type two was tuning out, and you could see the the eyes and the type five were lighting up. And so just as I was about to lose the type two, I would go over and say, "But the reason we came up with this solution is that you've got all these kids, and they want to be able to print within their classroom. And you know back when we came up with this, there was this guy named Tommy, and I met with Tommy, and Tommy had me up to his office, and he's such a great guy. You know, we actually used to go to the same church, and we're talking about relational issues and personal issues. And you could see him just light up, and then the type five was kind of like, "What? What does this have to do with anything?" And so I was waltzing back and forth across these two personalities, trying to keep them both engaged. And at the end of the day, I did. I kept them both engaged. And uh, just as one would about to, was about to tune out, I would switch modes. And so I think that helped me do my job as an evangelist better by understanding my audience. I could give you, you know, 10 such examples that are different types of examples, but the bottom line was it's effective to understand your, your audience and how to talk to them and what to talk to them about. Is it uh, manipulation? Sometimes these kind of techniques feel like you're manipulating your audience or the people you're talking to. Um, I would say that in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Uh, so I'll give you another example of manipulation uh, to give you uh, some contrast. So that example, no, there was no manipul- manipulation. It was me trying to tread water uh, without drowning. Um, another example was I was in Australia a while back, and on the way to the presentation, which was being held at a golf course, it was about 20 school uh, administrators there, I was talking to 
uh, my regional sales manager about type eights. He's a type two, and and how type eights act and react, and 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 the way that they are specifically. I was talking about the way they are challengers. They will poke you and they will test you and they will cry foul if if they think what you're talking about is wrong or what have you. And at the same time, they're also very protective. Uh, but you don't get to see the protector and, until they want to bring it out. And it's usually it can be bad or it can be good, but depends on how they bring it out. But this type eight, the first thing that happened when I got there, I'm on the first slide. I mean, the first slide passed, you know, welcome. <laughs> I flip to the first slide and I start talking technical. And this guy, uh, he was right on the front row. Just all of a sudden, he just leans back and he goes, oh, and I'm like, um, all right, uh, you have some input. And, and so he was challenging me, pushing me. That's not right. There's no way it works that way. I'm like, wow, this guy's either a rocket scientist and I'm an idiot, or he's a type eight because he was not going to let me go anywhere until he was satisfied. So what I recognized there was, you know, in a type eight, they're not doing this necessarily to, to be a jerk or to disrupt your, your presentation, but rather to feel safe in the room. He needed to let everybody else in the room know that I'm, I'm here, I'm independent, I'm powerful, I'm smart, um, I'm different, and I'm set, set apart from you, and you need to know that. So in this, this behavior, he wasn't talking to me. He was using me as a catalyst to talk to them. And so it, there's a technique we call matching and holding. And so if you match a type eight, um, if their energy pushes you or pokes you and you push back or poke back to the same intensity, um, uh, eventually they will stop. They, they will respect that. You don't want to fold and you don't want to overdo it because if you'd go either way to the extreme, they're going to take this as a big negative and we'll have a, a major reaction to that. So I kept matching him, giving him time. And, and, and sometimes he was right and sometimes he was wrong, but I kept doing that until he finally quit. And when he quit, you could see him just unbelievably turn into this protector and, 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 and so when uh, my sales manager came up to me, he goes, wow, that guy was sure an eight. And I said, he was, he is, and he'll be the last person at this, at this event. He'll still be here talking to other people about us, and he's not even our customer because now he feels like we've respected him, and now he has to protect us. And believe it or not, he was the last person there. He was, because I know how I would have acted and had I been in his shoes. So it wasn't that he was being mean or a jerk or attention getter or anything like that. He was just trying to feel safe in the room and exert his independence uh, from the group. And had I taken it wrong, then I would have, you know, I could have disrupted the whole thing or he could have, and we could have never had a successful presentation. So was I manipulating him? Yeah, I think so. To some degree, I knew how he was acting and why he was acting that way. So I matched him and held him until he quit. And then I used that protector afterwards to try to help us win some other customers because I probably wasn't going to win him at this point. Um, but yeah, so there's some manipulation possible if you choose to use it this way. I just don't think I choose to use it that way much. <laughs> Thanks for that feedback. There's a lot, lot of information there. Where would someone go if they wanted to learn these techniques and the, how to type people and how and what? Mm -hmm. It's not just knowing. It's it's also for each different type. There there must be some different techniques to to deal with each of the different types. As in, if you're an eight and somebody's a two, you act one way. But if you're a four and they're a seven, you do something different. So to answer your first question, a couple of good places to start that I've found is online. Uh, Enneagram Explorations is really great. Uh, Are you going to spell that? E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M is Enneagram. So Enneagram Explorations and Enneagram Institute is another really good one. That's the place I take classes. And, and so I've come to respect both of them's material is very accurate, and they certainly agree. Um, and there, there are local seminars as well. You know, like I say, Susan Olasek is really great, but there, you know, there's certainly some others in this area that, that teach that are uh, renowned like she is. Um, so, uh, I would say that those are good places. And then you can go to Amazon and find all kinds of books on Enneagram. There are, there's some for kids. There's some for, you know, for young adults. There's some about kids. There's, there's some that are super thorough that, you know, you'd almost want to be an expert before you read it like that. So that's good. But I would say in, you know, to kind of summarize uh, where I was going with all this is if I can be a better me by understanding myself, my effect on others, um, others, how they act and what the motivations, fears, desires are um, and how everybody's different. And I can appreciate the different views and types. Um, that's uh, uh, that's going to be helpful to everybody, including me and everybody around me. And question was. Is there a way that you act? No, I don't think so. I think you should be your genuine self. 
learning the Enneagram is not about being better inside your box because everybody's born in a box, I'll say. Um, they have a, a certain tool belt, a certain things they're real good at. And there's certain things they're not really good at and uh, things that, that, that cause problems, right? Negative sides to the personality. So learning the box you're in, understanding how you behave, what your motivations and fears and things like this are, what your automa- uh, automatic pilot looks like and how it behaves and how to be more present and understand if I can observe myself, if my inner observer, if I can observe myself in the middle of these behaviors or right as I'm about to to do a uh, behavior, you know, say, oh, I'm about to get angry. Oh, let's not, right? Uh, let's calm down. Whatever it is, I think um, that can only help you get out of the box. The best person you'd ever want to meet is the person who has no personality, right? Their, their personality is so lightweight. It's so transparent that you couldn't say, oh, they're definitely a seven. They're definitely a three. If you can't see that, they're they're more out of their box than in it but when you can really really see somebody's personality they're really chained to this this thing that they're born with this for better and worse you know everybody has one they don't change um but you can through being more present and aware of your own behavior and others you can be a little more transparent a little more lightweight in the personality department great well thanks for your time uh we don't always get to hear from Devin Aiken on soft skills, but uh, it was it was good to hear about not only just about the people, but how to interact with people. Any last words here? Yeah, I think I would say that if you if you haven't ever thought that, or, or thought about the value of people, you, that's your coworkers, your direct reports, your boss, uh, your family, you know, whoever this may be, especially those people who irritate you, who uh, who have differing opinions than you. I would say take the time to appreciate that everybody has a view of everything, and it might not be the same as yours. Theirs could be equally as valuable, equally as right. You only have part of the information, right? Your view is one of many, and and I think everybody together is better than any one by themselves. They have a more complete view. They have a better understanding of how things are. So I learned to appreciate people for their differences as well as their similarities. And, you know, for me, it just boils down to one simple statement. It's about loving people. You know, I love people. I say it all the time. I love people. Sometimes they really irritate me, but I still love them. I still think they're great and they're valuable. So I would say take the time to appreciate other people and how valuable they are. Thank you for your time. Back to Basics with Keith. Welcome back to the Wireless Land Weekly Tutorial. This is our section where we talk about some Wireless Land Basics. And today we're talking about the Radio Tap Header. Really what we're going to be talking about is how do we get it? Where does it come from? Who sends it? Kind of things. So first, before we get into the Radio Tap Header, we have to take a step back for a minute. And let's talk about how a wired network interface card or a NIC does its job. A wired NIC is connected uh, via copper, and across the copper pairs, there are electrons flowing. Those electrons have electrical energy, and depending on how they're modulated, the amount of energy in the flow, and etc., there's a lot of obviously details behind there I'm skipping, but that electrical energy is modulated a certain way, and the job of a NIC is to convert that electrical energy into bits. Obviously, there's techniques to do that. Forever ago, back when I was uh, first getting into networking, we actually had to take an oscilloscope and put it across a thin net cable and then figure out what the type of modulation was. And back then we used one call for a 10 base T. We used one called Manchester bit encoding. It's just a technique of how we put bits on by changing electrical properties. Well, the NIC takes the electrical signals that come in, turns them into bits, and it's a big string of bits. Well, how do we know which bits are which? Well, well, first we have a preamble, a set pattern, on, off, on, off, on, 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 off, 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 whatever the pattern is. And when we sync to that pattern where the preamble is, we know directly after that's going to be the header. Behind the header is the frame body. Behind the frame body is a CRC or a frame check. And what the wired NIC does is it looks at all those bits, throws away the preamble, looks at the header and says, is this frame for me? We look at the destination MAC address. If it matches my address, then that frame was for me. Or if it matches a broadcast address and I'm supposed to be listening there, I'll take it as well. If it's not for me, I just kind of ignore it. I don't do anything with it. If it is for me, the next thing we do is we look in the FCS, frame check sequence, or the CRC to make sure that there's no CRC error going on. We want to make sure that there was no bits that got changed. So if I send up this frame to the protocol stack above me, is it high quality? And so we check for CRC. If the CRC is bad, we throw the frame away. 
If it's good, we forward it then the protocol stack. And what we forward is just the payload of the Mac layer. And we're going to send that up the protocol stack to the next layer. It'll take off its header and send it up using normal encapsulation following the OSIM model. So that's how a wired NIC works. Next, let's move, and there's some graphics on this, but you really don't need them. Uh, if you want to go out to the website, take a look at them. How a wireless NIC. Now, a wire, big difference in wireless and wired is there's no copper. There's nothing touching the wireless NIC. So instead, what we would do at the front end is we have an antenna. Now, antenna's job, um, this is going to sound a little funny when I put it this way, but an antenna's job is to block all RF, except for the RF that we want. If you think right now where you were sitting or walking or driving, if you took a radio that could listen to any channel, where you're sitting right now, I bet you could hear marine band, aircraft, police band, AM, FM, TV, satellite, all of them are hitting you right now, but you just can't see radio frequency waves. So the job of the wireless NICs antenna is to block all the other ones except for the one it wants. Let's say it wants 2.4 gigahertz. So the antenna is tuned to only listen to 2.4 gigahertz. So what comes through past on the other side of that antenna are all 2.4 gig signals, including Bluetooth, microwave ovens, portable phones, baby monitors, etc. So we need to have another line of defense. We blocked all but 2.4. Now we have to block all except for those things modulated in 802.11. 802.11 has different modulation schemes, BPSK, QPSK, 16QAM, etc. But we block everything else. So even though Bluetooth is modulated, it's not modulated our way. So we have a blocker that will block that and only let through modulated bits. Well, at that point, we have bits exactly like we had on a wired NIC, meaning we have a preamble, header, frame body, FCS. We throw the preamble away, but now with the wireless NIC, we do something special. We add the radio tap header. Now this information was not sent. I'll say that one more time. Radio tap information was not sent. The transmitter did not put this inf these bits in there. There was a preamble there. But after it came into the receiver, we threw away the preamble because you don't need it anymore, and we replaced it with a timestamp, date stamp, channel stamp, power stamp, noise stamp. We measured at the NIC all this information about that set of bits. And then we prepend it to the front of the frame. We then do the same, check the MAC address, check for CRC errors, and if it's good, good, we send it up the protocol stack. But we have this extra little bit of information about how we received that individual frame. And if all we're doing is, you know, surfing the net, etc., that radio tap header also gets thrown away because the only thing we send up the stack is the payload. Well, now let's talk about the third way we're going to analyze and look at NICs by talking about wireless analyzers. Wireless analyzers have to do something different. First, what they're going to do is they're going to start with the same wireless LAN NIC, same process, antenna, modulation, filter bits, string it together, preamble header, frame body, FCS, do all of that including add the radio tap header, prepend it to the frame. But now when we look at uh, putting a wireless NIC into monitor mode or, or RF monitor mode or promiscuous mode, we're telling it to change a couple things. So there's a little shim in between the OS and the wireless LAN NIC firmware. And the shim says, when you get a CRC error, don't throw it away. We want to keep those because it's a way of analyzing the network to see how healthy it is. Next, if we're in normal wireless mode and the destination MAC address isn't yours, you throw it away. But we want you in promiscuous mode to take all the frames, even those that aren't yours. And so this little shim makes a couple changes that allows us to then take those radio tap headers and save them. Now we save them into, I'll just call it a data ball because they has, you know, every vendor has a different name for how they're actually saving these, but it's saved with the packet information, with the frame information, but we're now also saving the radio tap headers, which allow us, once the data is in the data ball, to do slicing and dicing. We can go through the data and say, show me everywhere where there is an AP transmitting on this SSID. Now, how do we know it's an AP? 
Well, APs, when they transmit, they leave a certain mark. Their BSSID is their own MAC address. And if the source and the BSSID match, you must be an AP. And so we can learn things about the frames that are going by. We can also learn things like when we saw a couple of weeks ago, we had DS bits as one of our tutorials. We know as a frame goes by, who's the transmitter, who's the receiver, who's the destination, who's the source. And all of that information is now available to us in this data ball and we can slice and dice it. Because everything that's in these analyzers comes from frames and the only way the frames got there is they went through the air, through the NIC, came in, we can have a pretty strong level of trust that the analyzer is going to be telling us the truth of what is actually happening in the air. Radio tap headers. It's where we get lots of information about the health of our network. I recommend you grab a copy of Wireshark and look in the radio tap header or Air Magnet or OmniPeak. They all have the ability to go in and see these and do queries about that information that's in that tap header. Thank you much. This is the Power Minute with today's podcast special guest. Wireless Land Weekly podcast. Uh, who is questions? Blake Crony. Okay, first question. Who are you? Where do you work? What do you do? And you can skip any of those pieces out if you don't like. Well, I guess, you know, who I am is a wireless architect by day. It's kind of what I do. And I work for a uh, Cisco Gold Partner located in the Southern. But, you know, we go, we go all around the nation and pretty much all around the world as well. So, Good. How did you get into the IT industry? Um, you know, it started a long time ago. I've always been into computers with my first Apple uh, Macintosh Classic that my grandpa gave me. I thought that was really cool, playing with like HyperCard, starting to program way, way back in the day. And then it just kind of started to progress. And then uh, going through college, you know, I was going for a mechanical engineering degree and I just started kind of seeing what my brother was doing in computer science and just kind of like, you know, IT was more of what, what I like to do, the networking and working with the computers, building computers. So started into help desk and then eventually into server administration and network administration. And then once wireless started taking off, that was kind of really the, the real cool thing because you can't see it. You don't know what, you, you can't just, you know, trace a wire and say, oh, yep, here's where the broken is, the broken piece of the wire is. So on the topic of certifications, I know you've got a bunch, but um, value of certification, is it recommended, required, or just a nice to have? I think it really depends on the certification. You know, some people will look at uh, certain certifications as they're, they're something that you just need to do for your job. And those are really like the, you know, specialization exams that a, a partner needs in order to be able to maintain, you know, for example, like if they're a Cisco partner, a gold status or a premier status or whatever your status might be. Those certifications really, they come and go. I, I think the ones that are important are the ones that you actually put value in and you actually make an effort to know the material. You know, if you're somebody that just goes out there and does a brain dump, what value does that certification hold? You really need to actually put everything that you have into it, you know, like the CCIE track, it's a very tough track to go through, even though their numbers are upwards now of 40,000 people, it's not an easy test by any means, regardless of which track you sit. So you value that certification because you spent a lot of time trying to get that. The same with the uh, CWNP program. You know, those are hard exams. They're not a simple exam. So you take the time and you know the material and it helps out. I think if anything, if you're just starting out in the industry, certifications are more important than anything because it's forcing you to learn material and learn at least what the book smart's going to tell you. You'll get the hands-on street smart after you actually start working for somebody. Uh, Follow-on question to that, what, what about a university degree helping uh, someone who's got a career in wireless industry? You know, university degrees, I, I graduated from a four-year program. What did it give me? It gave me very base underlying, you know, knowledge of networking and servers. But really, wireless was so fresh, it was hardly even talked about in our emerging technologies courses. So it's kind of one of those things that you look at university degrees, I think, uh, for anybody, a university degree shows that you have drive to succeed, which is what employers are looking for. They're looking to see, do you do you actually want to see something through to an end? Can you complete something? Because that's really what I, I get out of you know a university degree. I don't necessarily see, okay, if somebody has a university degree, they're that much better than somebody who doesn't. It's just that's just kind of you know one notch in a belt, and you got to add up all the notches and see see where you're at. 
how would you recommend someone who's new in the industry get experience to add that other notch? You know, you got to you gotta get yourself out there and get involved in the community is really the key piece of it. You know, be active in social media, whether it's Twitter or blogging or, you know, Google Plus, anything, because that's kind of where you're going to start to start to learn some of some of the war wounds that us veterans have had in the industry is we get to be able to share some of that, which I'll, you know, whatever we can share, we do. And that helps those people understand, you know, a learning process and, and at least being able to get some of that. They're not going to get the official experience, but they're going to get maybe some experience that they can bring back into their home labs to be able to actually, you know, practice on some of this. And I think that's the key aspect of it as well is a home lab is important. You have to be able to be willing to pay a little and have a lab that will help you learn the material and not expect a company to pay for you to learn something. I definitely agree with that one. Uh, yeah, one of the questions here was home lab, and you already answered it. Um, how important has social media been in your career and moving it forward? You know, I think it's uh, it's broadened my horizons, if anything. You know, it's given me a different viewpoint from a lot of stuff. I've been primarily Cisco focused for the better part of my career, and you start to see, you know, a one sided view of a vendor solution. You know, you start, you hear what vendor A has to say about vendor B and C and D, but it's their take on it. The social media has allowed me to get involved with other vendors that I maybe wouldn't in my day to day job, but then I can start to learn their material, whether it be them doing product demos for me or getting me eval units that I can, I can use and try to learn the materials. Uh, and, and then just, you know, learning and, and talking with folks like yourself, I mean, that's that's huge to be able to network pr- with people that aren't out there, especially in the wireless network. We're really small. It's a very small-knit community, and it, you got to get involved, and social media is the only way we can do that. Um, Mac or PC? Pretty short question, but could have a long answer. <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> so lead, lead the question. <laughs> Mac and PCs are kind of one of those, uh, you know, everybody loves using a Mac because it's a Unix underlining and you get a lot of the networking tools that we want from a packet capturing standpoint and, you know, being able to do some more interesting things with it, scripting, programmability. But at the same time, status quo has always been PCs. So a lot of our software tools from the various uh, vendors out there usually only come on PC. So you're kind of stuck with it. I think what it comes down to is you need to use what tool you're comfortable with for the job you're doing. And that's kind of that's kind of it is you could sit and debate the Mac and PC all day long, but it's really is what what are you comfortable with? I prefer using Macs at home. But I'll pretty much always use a PC for work because I know the tools that I need to to collaborate with others are going to be available to me. Who's been the most influential person in your career? Hmm, the most influential person in my career. That would be a tough one. I mean, I, I've looked at, you know, I've gone through many different jobs. Like I said, the help desk, network administration, server administration. I think in my wireless career, probably uh, Bryce Floyd, who hired me on at my first Cisco partner back in 2007, probably would be one of the most influentials on my career just because, you know, he really, when we were walking around doing a site survey, I actually hired him to do a survey for us. He kind of took the time to explain what he was doing as he was doing it which I think is very admirable of an, of an engineer and a consultant to take the time and do that while you're, you know, you're there to do a job, but then to also be able to know that, okay, I'm going to take, you know, five, 10 minutes extra here and there, and I'm going to talk to him and explain to him what's going on. And then when he hired me, he really spent a lot of time with trying to make sure I understood what it was that the solution was presenting and gave me a lot of uh, leeway to be able to take risks and, you know, learn from learn from leading myself and falling where I fell, but then being able to provide assistance. So, how can you be influential in other people's careers? You know, for me to be influential in other people's careers, really, what I look at doing is is trying to trying to help out where I can, whether it's with the blogging or social media, you know, tweeting out um, podcasts as well. I think that's where I'm trying to help other engineers get started because I'm trying to provide the tools for them to be able to learn some of it and, like I said, learn some of the war wounds that 
those of us have gone through. So hopefully they don't have to go through the war wounds as well. They can try to go around them and, you know, they'll get their own war wounds. And if they can skip the ones that we've hit, great. You know, they'll, they're learning from those experiences. So time to plug, no strings attached. Certainly. So the podcast that I mentioned is uh, the no strings attached show.com, NSA show.com or no strings attached show.com. Uh, what it is, is it's all, it's a vendor, a vendor neutral podcast, uh, primarily focused on wireless hardware, software tools. We try to get as many different people as on as we can just to try to get uh, a, a holistic approach at wireless. I've always said that, you know, we all need to be in this and succeed together or we're all going to fail together, whether we're competitors or not. RF is RF. The underlining rules are, are luckily there's, there's a standards base that we need to follow. And if you don't follow standards, you're going to have issues and, you know, we need to work together to make it happen. And that's kind of what we try to do on the show is just talk about everything that's upcoming and what's been released and uh, share our experiences as well of what tools work well and what kind of project workflows we use that work out. Good. Shows, I, I like the show too. It's good to have another podcast out there when when I went away. What's your blog and your Twitter handle and you know how do you want people to track you down? So if you, you want to track me down for uh, you know questions, I try to answer as many questions as I can that come in. Um, you can reach me at my blog at blakecrony.com, K-R-O-N-E.com. Um, otherwise, like I said, the NSA show.com blog, you can reach a lot of us as well there. Uh, Twitter is just at Blake Crony. So, you know, I try to keep things pretty simple and just use my first and last name. And so find me on Twitter or on my blog. And like I said, I can try to answer as many questions as you send in. What inspires you to get up and go to work in the morning? Inspiration to get up and go to work. You know, that's a tough one because nobody likes to get up and go to work per se. It's just, you know, I like the fact that I know I'm going to have a new challenge most days. You know, I got out of server administration for a reason. Always it was going to be patch Tuesday came. Here's, here's a list of 100 patches that need to be applied to a server. Oh, but wait, you've got 50 servers and they're only going to happen this one Sunday out of a month. So it's really, it's, you know, it's very, it's very uh, reactive. Here's a patch, here's a patch, do this. What I like about the wireless world is I can be a little bit more proactive. I can be more forward thinking and I, you know, I, I just, I, I love the technology. I love gadgets and gadgets don't work without wireless. That's, you know, if we didn't have wireless, we wouldn't have cell phones. We wouldn't have mobility that we do. And for me, mobility is huge and being connected. So that's really just the the ever-changing nature of wireless and mobility is what makes me get up and want to do this. So if money were no object and you didn't have to work for money, what would you be doing? If money wasn't an object and I... He didn't didn't need the money. I've always told my wife that uh, you'll see me driving a tractor on the side of a highway mowing when I want to retire. Just something, something that you know I can just sit there. It's peaceful. You know, actually, we just or my new one now actually is we just got back from a trip to um, Hawaii and we took a catamaran over from Maui to Lanai, and the captain was nice enough and just said pointed at that rock that's where we need to go so i sat there for an hour or so at the helm just keeping us on the course heading to it you know that's peace i if money wasn't an object i'd be out there driving driving that catamaran so if you could go back in time 10 15 years what would you say to your previous self <laughs> if i could go back in time what would i tell myself you know i would probably tell myself you need to learn to politic that's kind of one of the things that I've learned through my career is that as much as I hate politics, it's just, it's a fact of life that is something that I would need to work on. And some of my, uh, my soft communication skills could, could always been polished as I, as I was progressing through my careers. I've heard that a, a couple of times. So I think I would tell myself, you know, pay attention more in your, you know, in your like oral communications classes or interpersonal communication classes that I had at college. I thought, well, what do I need this junk for? Would your younger self have listened? Oh, my younger self never would have listened to me. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. It, I don't think there's anybody that would listen to the, an older self coming back and telling them to do something differently. What, what would you recommend to someone who's just starting their career in the wireless industry? What kind of a path, what kind of things would you ask them to think that they should be doing? 
You know, if you're just starting out into wireless, I think the the most important aspect of it is is really that you know you need to get involved. We've talked heavily about the social media. You know, that's that's huge. That's something that needs to be done. And then home labs. I cannot stress a home lab enough. It, I've interviewed quite a few people that when I start to ask them about, you know, what is your learning process? How do you learn? What, you know, if I ask you to get a new certification, how do you, how do you study for that? How do you prep? And so many times the answer really relies on, well, it's what you want me to do and what you provide for me. I I don't want what I'm going to, and I don't want somebody that I have to tell them what to do. I want somebody that's going to be willing to go out there and you don't have to go out and buy a thousand dollar Cisco AP or Aruba AP. You can go out and buy a Netgear AP and get the packet capture software, and you can capture those packets. Those packets are the exact same as what happens on an enterprise class. It's just an enterprise class. You're looking at you know three, four, five, six, et cetera, APs, and you get a little bit roaming. You get some better, some different different technologies involved in there. But to get started, you just got to make an effort. You got to put your leg out there and, and spend some money. It's gonna hurt for a little bit, but trust me, it'll it'll be paid off in the long run. Well, thanks, Blake, for answering the questions. Appreciate your time today, uh, sharing a little bit about who you are, and uh, hopefully we'll have everyone go and listen in on the No Strings Attached show. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast. Your source of education, information, entertainment, and inspiration. Thanks for listening and staying with the show to all the way to the end. We're glad you were able to listen and, and find a little bit of enjoyment, perhaps some education, inspiration, and fun uh, here on Wireless Land Weekly. Uh, we talked with Devin Aiken about uh, It's All About the People. We learned a little bit about where that radio tap header comes from, and we found out who is Blake Crony. Again, if you need to leave feedback, questions, answers, whatever you need, go ahead to, you can go to the Wireless Land Weekly uh, podcast website at www.wirelesslandprofessionals.com or just a short version is wlampros.com. Go ahead and leave feedback there or send an email to feedback at wlampros.com. Thanks for listening and we'll have another episode for you next week. Thank you for listening to the Wireless Land Weekly Podcast. Head to wlandpros.com for this episode, show notes, and the latest industry news. Connect today, wlandpros.com.